One of the most important offices to be decided by voters in Los Angeles County this coming November will be for district attorney. The two candidates vying for the position currently held by Steve Cooley are Deputy District Attorney Alan Jackson and Chief Deputy District Attorney Jackie Lacey. The candidates were chosen after a June primary in which Lacey beat out Jackson with 32 percent of the vote. Jackson came in second with 24 percent and current city attorney Carmen Trutanich came in third and was thereby eliminated from running for the office. Alan Jackson, whose fame centers around his prosecution of music producer Phil Spector, is backed by the Republican Party, while Lacey is backed by Democrats. However, this election is nonpartisan. If elected, Lacey would become the first African-American and first female district attorney in L.A. County. The two main police unions, as well as State Attorney General Kamala Harris and current District Attorney Steve Cooley, have all pledged their support for Lacey. One of the main points of contention between Jackson and Lacey centers around Proposition 36, which would reform formed the three strikes law. Jackson stands against an overhaul of three strikes while Lacey is in favor of the measure that would only administer life sentences to the most serious offenders. Both candidates support the death penalty. The LA County DA's office is the top prosecutor of the nation's most populous county. Jackie Lacey now joins me in studio. Welcome to Uprising. Why thank you. It's good to be here this morning, Smiley. Well, let's start with how you describe yourself to LA voters. Um, not everybody is tuned in to local politics. Politics. Uh, the office of the district attorney, as I mentioned, is a very, very important position. When you meet and greet uh, potential voters and supporters of yourself, how do you describe uh, yourself to them and what it is you would do if elected? Well, I tell them a little bit about my background. I am an L.A. native. Uh, my uh, parents, uh, Addie and Lewis, came from the South back in the 50s, like a lot of African Americans, to escape uh, the discrimination and racism that was uh, going on in the South, and they came here for a better life. They were, they were uh, poor people who came with uh, very little money but a dream. And uh, my father worked for the lot cleaning division of the city of L.A. My mother worked in the sewing factories doing um, piece work, which is ironing, um, you know, seams and clothing that was later to be distributed in stores. And later she got a job working for L.A. LAUSD, uh, the Los Angeles Unified School District, as a cook. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm the first kid in my family to go to college. I have a sister, Carol. And um, I, I, that was the mantra in my family, go to college, go to college. And so I uh, went to UC Irvine, later got a scholarship to the University of Southern California for law school. And I became a prosecutor pretty much shortly after I left uh, law school. And I found that it was my calling. I enjoyed being in the courtroom, and I've been in the courtroom for 15 years trying some of the most uh, serious and violent criminals in our L.A. County history. But for the last 12 years, I've had a ringside seat uh, with the district attorney of L.A. County, Steve Cooley, helping to learn the business side of running a prosecutor's office. And I'm now ready to be the top person in that office and run the largest and the best prosecutor's office in the nation. Well, your uh, opponent, Alan Jackson, uh, one of his main criticisms of you, he says that you're out of touch with the courtroom. Um, you're currently the chief deputy, deputy district attorney. His title is deputy district attorney. What is the difference between your two jobs, uh, and, and how would you explain that to a lay audience? Well, the way I explained it, Sonali, is... Um, Just to verbally walk people through an organization chart, because most organizations have an organization chart, and that helps to sort of understand how we run. There's a thousand lawyers in our office. There are 2,100 people all together. We have our own in-house law enforcement agency of about 250 sworn personnel. The district attorney is the elected official. I sit right beneath him as the chief deputy, and I'm in charge of running the day-to-day uh, operations. I'm in charge of budget, of legislation, of managing resources, and of how we spend our money and how we manage our uh, resources uh, there. Uh, under me, there are three assistant DAs who help to run three different segments of the office. Under them, there are uh, seven, I believe, directors who help to run another um, their segments of the office, and under them are about 40 head deputies, and the 40 head deputies run different units, different branches, and then under 
the 40 head deputies are assistant head deputies. And Mr. Jackson is an assistant head deputy helping to run um, a unit. And so his experience and exposure to the various different parts of the office is limited. Uh, I have a decade, more than a decade of uh, more experience than he does in managing uh, this office. Mm -hmm. And one uh, further point that I think never gets made, you know, District Attorney Steve Cooley does not go in the courtroom. That's not his job. His job is to make sure that uh, the lawyers who do go in the courtrooms are adequately prepared, and that uh, there are there are policies in place to make sure that justice is um, administered in an even-handed manner. Mm -hmm. And so it's a misunder it's a, his it's he's counting on you not understanding what the job is about. Well, let's talk about uh, the kinds of issues that if you were elected, you would be dealing with uh, in your job. One big issue here in Los Angeles is the recent LA, Con LA City Council's ban on marijuana dispensaries. Uh, a group of people and organizations sued to suspend the ban uh, and are suing the city. Uh, many of our listeners are advocates of uh, marijuana legalization. Uh, and Alan Jackson is favorable to the dispensaries. Uh, what is your position on it? Well, um, I, I'm going to take this minute just to explain that we're not L.A. City. Mm -hmm. uh, L.A. County is different from L.A. City. We're not part of the lawsuit. Uh, I'm not part of the ban. And um, uh, so, uh, but L.A. City obviously is the largest of the 88 cities in L.A. County and arguably the most influential. My position uh, is as follows, Sonali. I follow the law. It's my, it's my job as the prosecutor, uh, uh, the, the district attorney in the future to follow the law. And the law says that if you are sick under the Compassionate Use Act, you're entitled to obtain marijuana in a lawful and safe manner. And so I support that. Those that are sick, those that have the uh, necessary recommendation should have access to uh, marijuana in a legal form. But the over-the-counter dispensaries that sell marijuana for profit are illegal, according to the case law. Hmm. And, and they are not authorized. So how would one legally buy uh, a prescription uh, marijuana? Right. According to... Uh, to the law, they're supposed to be part of a cooperative, and it's very clearly defined in the law what a cooperative is. And but the over-the-counter uh, sales in a storefront with a flashing neon sign, a place that's open, um, you know, right outside the Hollywood Bowl on a Saturday or Friday night with a flashing neon sign is not really what the law envisions. It envisions uh, a much more um, a pharmacy-like setting, and that's not really what the over-the-counter dispensaries are. They they are uh, people stop in, they leave, and we're getting a lot of complaints. A lot of people who voted for the Compassionate Use Act, Sonali, call and complain about the way the dispensaries are being operated. But don't drug companies also make profits when they sell pharmaceuticals well, to the Well, but they public? do, but it's authorized by the law. It is not, it, it, that, I, I'm just telling you what the law is. The law doesn't authorize uh, dispensaries um, to to make a profit, and they make huge profits out of those. And there's a criminal enterprise in some of them. So, uh, Let's talk about the California Three Strikes Law, another very big issue here in uh, California. It's been a controversial uh, law. There's also a ballot measure uh, this year on that issue. There's There have been ballot measures before. Proposition 36 this November would shorten the sentences for third strike offenders if the third strike crime is not serious or violent. I understand that your position on three strikes has changed over the years. Where do you stand on it now? Where do you stand on the proposition in particular? Well, I, I wouldn't say that my position has changed. Um, when the third strike law was enacted, I was a trial lawyer. And the policy of the L.A. County District Attorney's Office at that time was we pro if the third strike was a was you know, was a petty crime, we still sought life sentences. And there is a case that um, is reported where a, I was prosecuting a case where, um, where I felt that this 19-year-old kid should not go away for life. It was a non-serious, non-violent. And um, luckily, our office changed their position on it, and I'm happy that they did. It's the right decision. What what so you were always disturbed by always. by by this uh, sort of draconian, <laughs> uh, over the word. top, 
Uh, if the third kind of, strike was stealing a slice of pizza, yeah. That, you know, it's ridiculous. And, and so here's what I'll say. So I'm glad you brought this particular topic up because I, I think that it is an important um, difference between my opponent and I. You know, in, in L.A. County, for the last 12 years, we have a policy where we have not been sending a person away if the third strike is non-serious and non-violent. But the rest of the counties, the rest of the counties in California have been doing that. And um, this law would make L.A. County's policy essentially the county all over the, um, the policy all over the state. And it's the right thing to do. It's worked so well for us. We've, L.A. County, with this, um, in the last 12 years, the crime rates have dropped to a new 60-year low. So we've demonstrated that it can be done, that Armageddon won't happen if we are reasonable in how we punish people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in favor of it. I've been very vocal from the very beginning. My opponent is not. Um, and I think it's sort of hypocritical because he supports the current policy, but he doesn't want it to be for the entire state, and it should be. Hmm. Let's talk about another criminal justice issue, and that's the death penalty. Uh, Californians will also be voting this November on a ballot measure that would end the death penalty and commute existing death sentences to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Uh, and if it passes, California becomes the 17th state in the country to set aside the death penalty. Why are you in favor of the death penalty? Well, I'm a career prosecutor. I, I um, for the last 27 years of my life, my day job is uh, going to the office and being exposed on a regular basis to some of the most horrendous and evil acts. Um, and my experience sitting on the death penalty uh, committee for 10 years has really shaped my views about this. I don't think the death penalty is appropriate for every case, but as a prosecutor, I would like to have it available for those who are, who are truly evil, who commit some of the worst acts. An example is the grim sleeper who killed all of these women uh, in the South LA area, got away with it. Why should that guy get the same penalty as someone who commits one murder. But what is the benefit of having a death penalty if the grim sleeper is put away um, for life? It, clearly, he's not a threat to society. I, I think the benefit is it's just the right punishment. Uh, I don't, um, it's hard the way you've described it as benefit. Uh, justice is such an, um, it's a hard word to describe. It's, hard, it's a hard um, uh, thing to describe. But I, I, would, I would say that there are just some crimes. For instance, I had a death penalty case where a man um, killed two um, shopkeepers. He committed a string of robbery and killed two men who just happened to be working that day uh, on their jobs and, because they were there. And one of the then one of the murders was uh, captured on videotape. I dealt with the family, the witnesses. I saw the impact that that death had on those children who will grow up without their father. Um, and it, it seems to me at the end of the the um, at the end of the proceeding, when the jury came back and said we agree that this man deserves death, that it was not a pleasant or happy occasion, but it certainly seemed to be the right punishment for what he had done. Well, one can argue those points, but the, another point that is often raised is the cost of administering the death penalty. There was a study released just on Monday that concluded that under California's current criminal justice system, it would cost taxpayers between 5 and $7 billion more to execute a prisoner than it would to carry out a sentence of life without parole. And I, I don't know if you consider uh, issues of, 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 of finances in the state, you, you know, you would be the prosecutor if you if you did get elected um, of, the, of the L.A. County. But does that uh, have a consideration for you? Well, the California Constitution re requires me at the, right now to carry out the death penalty. It doesn't really provide for me to do a cost-benefit sure. analysis. Obviously, I'm always uh, mindful of the cost of, uh, of, of the punishment. Uh, that we use. For instance, incarceration actually happens to be the most expensive cost right now that, uh, to the criminal justice system. Part of the cost of the death penalty um, implementation is the length of appeals and how long they take. Uh, that's something that I think can be corrected by legislation, but I do not believe that it is time to do away with the death penalty because the cost of the appeals is t is is what um, is what's driving it. I think 
the public has to um, make a decision. Do they believe that this is the right penalty for some of these crimes? Mm-hmm. And they, they are horrendous. Well, uh, on the issue of incarceration, California has uh, the most overcrowded prisons in the country. Do you think we imprison too many people? Well, um, in, in California, mm-hmm. um, I think there are alternatives for lower level offenders that I would like to see implemented. I've been part of the team that has um, instituted alternative sentencing courts, courts for veterans, reentry courts for women, and uh, for those suffering from mental illness. And I think there are all alternative ways to um, treat the lower level offenders. Some of the more violent criminals have to continue to go away. They have to. And uh, I think that whether we like it or not, re- realignment has been um, has been implemented by the governor. And uh, less people are going to be going to state prison and going to jail. I'm worried about crime starting to uh, rise. But I do think there are some cases where uh, an alternative to jail is probably the right decision for us because the recidivism rates are so high. People go to prison, they come out, and they reoffend within five years. If we can peel out some of those lower level offenders uh, and put them on probation, get them, you know, the rehabilitation services, whatever they need. I think that's a better alternative mm-hmm. right now. And and uh, speaking of L.A. County and, and the jail system here, the, which is, of course, a very controversial issue, there's um, been many serious allegations of abuses within L.A. County's uh, jails and uh, against Sheriff Lee Baca himself. And I don't know if, the, if there's anything you want to add to that or to mention on that issue. Uh, the... The ethical canons prevent me from sure. commenting on anything that is currently going on. Uh, there was a case earlier this week um, that involved the arrest of a physician on murder charges because she prescribed pain medication to people who overdosed. Um, the LA Times reported that doctors are worried about this arrest, saying it sends a chilling effect in their profession, holds them responsible for their patients' behavior. Uh, Los Angeles has so many high-profile cases. This is a county that is home to many celebrities. Some of whom end up overdosing in, in very high-profile um, newsworthy cases. Um, and your um, uh, the person who might become your uh, predecessor, Steve, uh, District Attorney Steve Cooley, says that he wants this arrest to send a message to other doctors. What is, what is your position on such an issue? Well, it's a pending case. I've actually reviewed that case, so I'm not going to comment specifically on that case. Uh, my position is that, uh, that uh, doctors who are following the law don't need to worry. It's the doctors who are misusing their prescription pad to um, give drugs to an addict without any sort of examination. And does this relate to the marijuana issue, the medical marijuana Uh, issue? Well, I don't think it does, but in any case, uh, any sort of medication, uh, or excuse me, examination with any follow-up. And uh, if a number of your patients are dying and you're not changing your behavior and you're not following the law, I I think the district attorney has to uh, prosecute those cases. Mm -hmm. If you are elected in November, you would be the top prosecutor in the nation's most populous city. You would also be the first African-American and first woman in that position. How significant is this? Um, This is one of the most diverse cities and counties in the country. And it's, is it amazing to you that, that county DAs have been all male and mostly white? <laughs> well, I, I think that, um, first of all, I always remind people that I am the most qualified person running, clearly now, when we're down to two candidates. And we have one with, um, with who's been a real prosecutor in the courtroom and who has also been in a leadership position and who has the best ideas that are more in line with how L.A. County residents think, that, um, that that's, that's really what should weigh into your decision. I am proud, though, of who I am. I'm proud uh, to be a woman, to be an African American, and to have an opportunity to even get this far is amazing. No one has ever gotten this far. And so what I would say is it is good for all of us to celebrate whenever a glass ceiling comes down. Uh, No, that office should not be off limits to someone because of their gender, race, uh, 
the sexual orientation or anything. Mm-hmm. If you're qualified, you should get that job. Do you hope to be a role model to little girls of color? I hope so. I hope to all women. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm concerned about there are a lot of women who aren't running for office because they don't think it's worth it. But I think we need women in leadership positions. Women um, are problem solvers, and uh, this uh, if there there's no um, there. Th- the LA County District Attorney's Office uh, has so many issues that come before it, and you need someone who knows how to solve issues, who knows how to work with other people to help solve issues. So. Finally, Jackie Lacey, USC's Annenberg South LA report had an op-ed recently about your race, and this is how they characterized the job. They said the district attorney is, in essence, the lawyer for the people, prosecuting felonies and misdemeanors in the community. The person carrying out the duties of the LA County office must understand the concerns of a diverse public with distinct economic, ethnic, cultural, generational, and class interests that is at times in conflict. This awareness equips the person to identify commonality in community issues, prioritize prosecution caseload, and effect manage the office while mindful of the sensibilities of all stakeholders. Moreover, the integrity of the DA must be beyond reproach, a prerequisite necessary to inspire and sustain trust that the law is being administered fairly. Do you feel that you fit this bill? Sonali, I couldn't, I, I certainly, I certainly agree with the description of the job. Whoever wrote that clearly understands what's required. I feel that in terms of the candidates that are running, I best fit that description of the job. Hmm. What, finally, would you say to those voters who are undecided? A poll recently showed that you were leading uh, 26 to 13 percent, which is a very big lead, but there's a huge number of undecided voters. Well, the crim- first of all, the criminal justice system is one of those things that everybody talks about. People think they have, don't have an interest in the criminal justice system, and you bring up some case, some headline, pretty much everyone has heard about it. It's a very important uh, decision. There will be um, a lot of issues facing the criminal justice system in the upcoming uh, years. You need someone, you need an adult at the table, and I've often said that that's what you have in me. You don't have someone who's hysterical, who runs around uh, thumping their chest, uh, but what you have is someone who's very calm, reasoned, rational, but knows how to speak up when it's necessary mm-hmm. and lead. And so it is very important. Uh, and uh, I would say to the undecided voters that look at the people who endorse me. The Los Angeles Times, um, Kamala Harris, Steve Cooley, the L.A. County Police Chiefs. Well, uh, Jackie Lacey, I want to wish you the best of luck in your race today, and thank you so much for spending this time with us in studio. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Sonali.